So this is the spoiler review of episode 5 of season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, The Saints of Imperfection, and on its own it was a slightly weaker episode plot-wise, but I think it will play a major linchpin for future developments and ties more into the overarching narrative. We get a lot of much needed lore and explanation on things, like the spores, and it sees the return of several old crew members to the Discovery. And, as usual, the visuals were on points with some interesting effects. I'll be honest, whenever the series dips back into plot threads from series 1, I am reminded of all the issues I had with it, and this episode had plenty of callbacks. Saying that, it did so with the understanding that it needed to address some unanswered or glossed over mysteries, and it's unrealistic for Discovery to just drop them. Personally, I'd rather see them repair and explain a lot of the changes and unanswered questions. Also, sore throat alert, and as usual, please excuse the use of Star Trek Online footage in places to help prevent copyright issues. So, to begin, this episode is all about belief and faith, and not necessarily that of religious origin. Faith in friends, in strangers, colleagues, and trusting against your better judgement. Can Burnham trust Georgiou, Pike and Tyler, May and Tilly? It carries elements of the scientist encountering the miracle, or the unexplainable and ascribing science where some may see divine motivation, all themes that were promised in the origin of Season 2. So, Section 31 is now involved in the primary plot, and it seems now both Pike and Leland are running the same investigation. Up to his arse in Alligators on Cestus 3. While this is obviously a nod towards the TOS episode Arena, but I think it's meant to be taken at face value. The, the Gorn were still an unknown at this time, Cestus III would have been a fledgling Federation colony, and I can't imagine Pike calling the Gorn alligators. Also, the look on Pike's face when he shushes Michael is priceless. It's like he's aware she's about to make some smart comment about Spock or Section 31 and he just cuts her off. She's been shown to be a passionate individual when necessary, but diplomacy is really not her strong point. Later on, he confronts Burnham for withholding information, and this ties into the opposition to Leland, Tyler and all of Section 31, downright stating his distaste for Cloak and Dagger and morally grey areas. Chris Pike continues to represent the core principles of a Starfleet captain, at odds with everything that Starfleet strives to outgrow, and the inclusion of these elements troubles him. The return of Tyler to the crew raises alarms for Pike, who only knows the official record that he was a Klingon imposter. So I guess unlike knowledge of the Mirror Universe, Starfleet has made Klingon infiltrators a known threat. Another thing that I've noticed but wasn't sure on until this episode is the inclusion of a lot of horse riding and western terminology from Pike. Don't spare the horses, back in the saddle, and so on nice bit of characterisation there that gives the hint of his Mojave roots. That's where horses are built, right, the Mojave? I, I don't know, I'm English. I just get a bit of an old western time theme from him. Leland sums up Section 31's philosophy in one sentence. We do what we do so you can do what you do. One thing I'm not too keen on is the blasé attitude towards Section 31 that everyone seems to have. It's long been established that Section 31 is more than top secret and only rumour, yet here they are, showing off their badges and Pike seems to know exactly what they are. It seems the writers are replacing Starfleet Intelligence with Section 31, and that shouldn't be the case. Though this is mostly coming from Georgiou's flaunting of her new status. Which fits with her character, she enjoys having power and knowledge over others, but what made Section 31 so menacing was that it was such an unknown, we didn't know what tech they had, just supposed it was a head of everything available to Starfleet, which added an air of mystery to them. It made them seem insidious and dangerous, and I think losing that would be disastrous to their credibility and allure. It also seems that they have comm badges the tech that won't be available for standard use for at least another 40 years, though we don't know the range or the signal, so it's plausible. Ash's use of it confuses the hell out of Pike. Also, Section 31 used a holographic matrix to hide its ship. 
less of a stretch for them to use this, as Section 31 isn't bound by the Prime Directive and therefore has no qualms about taking technology from other species. Holomatrix camouflage has been around since the Romulan War back in 2154. The way the Discovery breaks into the Spore Network does a great picture of illustrating the turmoil its drive can bring to the native species, with quakes and stellar intrusions from the grand scale of the saucer section. From our side, it really looks as if the Discovery is listing at sea, and the groaning hull conjures images of a sinking ship, with sailors scrambling away from rising waters. We have a name for the fungal creatures that inhabit their network now, the Josep. It seems they perform a similar function to fungi in real life, that is they break down matter and tie into the cycle of life on a larger scale. The implication is that any matter or even energy that enters into phasic space gets consumed by the Josep. This is some much needed clarification in my opinion. Shedding light on what the mycelial network is and how it operates goes a long way for justifying its existence. There has to be a reason for science fiction, otherwise it's just magic or science fantasy. In this case a magic mushroom network. The Jessep it seems aren't malevolent nor benevolent, though they seem capable of advanced scientific feats. They are simple in their view of things. That is a threat, a monster. That is help, a friend. That is food. It's unclear if May is a formation of a single Josep, a colony, or even if there's a difference. But this episode sets up some rules in the opening scenes that it then sticks to throughout this story. Critical in maintaining a sense of continuity. Tilly was transported in, physically. May had to inhabit a vessel in order to survive in our realm. Our matter, in the network as we see it, is consumed and incompatible with the matter native to the network. These elements come into play in the final minutes of the show. Kolba has been trapped in the network since Season 1, and the explanation they give is that while Stamets' mind was fluctuating between the two planes, while he was catatonic, in Kolba's dying moments, his consciousness was transferred too. So, in a sense, this really is Kolba, despite him physically dying. This also removes the notion that the network is basically heaven, and again brings that element of science, well, Hollywood science, into the narrative, clarifying the more abstract notions of the mycelial network. This is needed, as if this season truly is about the notion of faith versus science, then we need to be presented with both options, so that a valid notion can be raised for either side. Besides, how do you quantify a spirit? Is Kolba's disembodied essence the same thing? And more importantly, will it matter to Stamets and Kolba? I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in saying that I saw the ending coming, Kolba not being able to leave due to the conservation of mass. Kolba's body is long gone, and we've established that passing through the network requires a physical transport through the spore drive or maze organic transporter. So seeing his goodbye was touching, but expected. What I didn't expect was them to use May's device to reconstitute a new body for Kolba by converting him from mycelial network stuff into our world stuff. I don't think this is going to be a smooth transition, and I foresee trouble down the line for him. In both science, fantasy and religion, resurrection often demands a price, and while this is more akin to a transformation of states, the allegories during the closing narration call out the symbolism. We of course get a reveal that high levels of tachyons are left in the wake of the red bursts, suggesting time travel, cloaking or transport. The emphasis seems to be very much on time travel, so perhaps this explains why the angels guiding people to places and events at the right moments, to shape some greater plan. There's been theories to that effect for some time, so that's increasingly likely. Great, the one thing Star Trek's universe needed more of was interference in the timeline. So there we have episode 5. There was a lot of effort in addressing plot elements from Season 1 that were left hanging, and this one did a lot to re-establish the core theme of science and religion, this time looking at the nature of miracles through a microscope. 
reminds me of that episode of Voyager Sacred Ground, where Janeway has to undergo rituals to save her crewmates. Turns out that there was a scientific reason for their survival, but the act itself needed faith. So we're set up now for several character arcs to continue into new directions, all the while gaining on Spock, who seems to be at the centre of it all. I'm going to refrain from any rampant speculations at the minute, but Spock has long been at the centre of time travel and even the creation of alternate universes, so perhaps things will move in strange new directions. We'll just have to wait and see. Thanks for watching. I've been Rick, and I really need a drink now. <laughs> Goodbye.